Oh, sorry, I didn't realize, I didn't see you there. Welcome to the C programming language in 61C, woo! So great to have you here. Before I begin, I want to uh, acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We, Bora and I, um, want to give lots of thanks to other faculty who have shared in the contribution of these slides. Many, many folks, we all just pass the slides to each other as we teach these classes, so I want to thank Nick Weaver, Dave Patterson, John Morzenek, Kirsty Osanovich, Randy Katz, I'm going to forget somebody, I'm sure, uh, Brian Harvey, Mike Clancy, um, Mickey Lustig, lots of folks who have been part of this faculty family, uh, Kubi, who are wonderful, and I want to thank them for all their contributions to Six Sigma This is not just the two of us creating these slides from scratch, we all hand them again, as I said, to the other folks who do that. The course used to be called Machine Structures, so let's at least take a step back. It's now called The Great Ideas in Computer Architecture. Let's take a step back and understand about a little bit basics of computer organization. It's one of the earliest computers. They were computers before that, but this is the earliest kind of big press computer. The ENIAC at UPenn 1946, the time to take it back. We had just come back from World War II, the war was over, and this is now hitting all the news headlines. It was an exciting time to be around, around the country. It was the first electronic general purpose computer, Fast at the time, um, multiplies in, in 2.8 milliseconds. You could do 10 decimal digits times 10, 10, 10 decimal digits, the size of that. That's a pretty big number, and it could do that pretty fast. But the problem is it took two or three days to program. And you see all the patch cords in the picture. That's how you program them. You'd, you'd program the patch cords, you'd read the schematic, you'd write the patch cords, and then maybe you turn some switches and knobs. And it was remarkable. Um, vacuum tubes were breaking all the time. It's remarkable that they were able to do what they did. The programs they used to run at the time were a lot of ballistics trajectories, figuring out you know, if I how to angle for this kind of wind, how, to, how much to angle and how much maybe thrust. I don't know what are the controls they have, but where, where it would land essentially, and kind of for the elevation changes, how to, you know, that kind of thing. So complicated, very, I mean, simple things to do now, but for a while to do that by hand was difficult and actually a lot of those simulations were done on that system. So hard. I also want to recognize the folks you see in the picture, um, that young woman on the right, many of the, the first programmers uh, were computers. And I say, what do you mean by computers? The people who did the computation by hand, if you hope you've seen the movie Hidden Figures, the computers were people who did the computation by hand. So the early programmers were often women who were part of the UPenn uh, group, and they don't get enough press for being among the early uh, programmers of the day. But I think they were recently honored, uh, and so I'm glad to see that. But that's important to acknowledge. EDSAC in Cambridge in 1949 was the first general stored purpose computer. And what's different about this is that you all take it for granted. You know, you have an iPhone and you download uh, a GIF, or you download a, a JPEG, you download an MP3 on, on any device, in any device, right? You also download a program. And you don't even think about it, the fact that downloading data and downloading a program is the same download feature. It's the same function. You just click a different thing and you just source it, and now it's, a, it's an app that you have on your, on your, on your phone. It was a big deal back then. If you were programming by rerouting things to be able to think about why couldn't a program itself be data? And that idea is called the stored program concept. Really, really powerful. Um, and now that meant that bits can be bits and bits can be a program too, and that's just wonderful. You can manipulate the program in the same way, in the same ease, and through the same data channel. We'll learn about what the words are uh, later. Data path is the official word for that. But the same kind of pathways as you use for your data. So your programming data could just flow in the same pathway. And you'll notice that picture has no more patch cords. So that's a really big deal. That was, for those three years, that was a wonderful idea. The bottom bullet says that they had a 35-bit binary twos complement word. Uh, and that goes in, I think my colleague Nick Weaver says, who knows why they did that? This is, this is because it, was good, it seems good at the time. There might be some technical reasons, but it's lost to history why they used that rather than a kind of power of, power of you know, two uh, with, with word. So also put some put in perspective, you saw this slide, I believe, on the first lecture. Um, this is the wonderful layers of abstraction, as you'll see. And we're at the top layer. Just to put some context where we are, we're going to be talking about a high-level program. Now, we think of C as a high level. People who are in the programming language community, they say, that's ridiculous. What's something, you know, uh, Python-y higher than that might be a high level language, and they'll think C as a lower level language. We'll call it high level because it's not manipulating bits directly. You still can do that, but it's not writing machine code. That really is what the low level languages we call. So we'll call C a high level language, even though we know that there are a lot of higher level languages than C. This book is a dated book. This is, like I guess, the original book that pre-ANSI, the picture on the right, was I think in 86 where it came out, and that's when the first ANSI standard came out. Um, 
he has gone, undergone some, some more transformations, some more upgrades than that first version, but for the most part, we'll talk about ANSI C, and then we'll talk about some of the additions that have gone to that. So K and R, Kernigan Ritchie, you know you became famous if you're just known as a letter. Your last name is a letter. If you lose your last name, it's already pretty good. Prince, Madonna, right? That's pretty good. Sade. Um, you go, you go to this, and they're just K and R. So just the letter uh, is that's pretty pretty cool fame in the computer science world. I'm read. You, I usually don't read quotes, but this is a good quote. C is not a very high level language nor a big one. It's not specialized to any particular area application, but its absence of restrictions and its generality make it more convenient and effective for many tasks than supposedly more powerful languages. So it's already kind of a dig on other people saying, touting their language, look at us, look at us, supposedly. I, like, I just, when I write, I want to kind of write like that in the future. The other thing that's exciting about C back in the day, this is some historical context, is that it allowed the first um, operating system not written in assembly. You don't really know what assembly is, but we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a couple lectures from here. After, actually, after the C lecture is, we'll talk about assembly language. Um, Unix is a portable OS. What it means is you can write the code for the OS and then take it to a different architecture and move it around. That was a big deal, couldn't have been done before. Because remember, writing an assembly means writing and customizing for that assembly language. If I have another machine, different assembly language, I have to rewrite it there. But if I can write it up here, and then it can be, we'll, do my, we'll learn the word compiled down to assembly. Now I'm writing it up here, and now I can move it to different languages, very different machines, architectures textures very easily. That makes sense? If you're writing in the actual language of the machine, you can't really move it. Um, but if you can write at a level above that, again, a level of abstraction, again, abstraction, the most important idea in this class, that's pretty powerful. Why are we teaching you C? Of all the languages to teach you, I want to just stay Java. I've actually, some houses, I, I've traveled the country, and many schools are Java, Java, Java in the first CS, first three CS courses. We take pride at Berkeley of having three different languages. As of the writing, as of this video, the three languages are Python, Java, and C, but the goal is never to teach you languages. The goal, this course is never to teach you C. The goal is to teach you computer science. Uh, we just happen to find that it's really great to have a breadth of languages, so it doesn't all look like everything's a Java. You know, if you have a Java hammer, everything looks like, looks like a nail. So you want to make sure you have enough languages to be fluent to decide which language to choose for a particular problem. So, why C? We can write problems that allow us to exploit the underlying feelings, feelings, features of the architecture. What that means is C is low enough level to silicon, to the actual machine, that you can be poking at bits and understand exactly the width of things and kind of have more control over things. The higher up you go in the abstraction hierarchy of languages, the, the more control you give away in your programming. But C is low enough to be able to know, I know exactly what I'm doing. It also makes it hard to program, and I'm, I'm always impressed I mean, amazed that people still use C in their early languages, because I believe it takes three courses to understand how to program first, and then we'll talk, talk to you how to how control the machine really well. It's almost like a car where you stripped away all the plastic in this, and all you have is wires, and you're kind of <laughs> rewiring wires to make your car work, and jump-starting it that way. That's kind of what C is. C is close enough that you can really get in trouble. C uh, is still one of the most popular programming languages after 40 years. It's remarkable how long, how much, how many le how much legs C has had. However, if you're starting a new program and, and you don't have a lot of legacy code to deal with, so if you have legacy code, you gotta live with your C, you gotta live with your C sharp, you gotta live with that. It's advantageous that C, uh, that C came around and then Java kind of learned from C and was still in the same family. You're gonna see a lot of Java connections, but it isn't because Java came first and C came later. C was first and Java learned from that and didn't want to be so different from C that we had to retrain all the C programmers, all the different, that's the reason Java was close enough to C because people came from a C um, cut their teeth in C, and they wanted to continue with that. So Rust is a C but safe language, so if you want to kind of have this power of C, low level of C, but think about more safety, we're going to show later on in the series of lectures how much trouble you can get into with pointers and memory leakages and just shaky code. And Rust is, makes, it, makes the programming experience a lot cleaner. So it's the same thing that a compiler would do uh, in Java in terms of checking types. C doesn't do that because C is not strongly typed. So you can really be messing with types and take a pointer to this and move it around and then change the bits. I mean, it's powerful and crazy what you can do in C, and that's why the compiler can't check all of those things. Uh, you can if you restrict those things. Uh, so that's what Rust is going to do for you. If you want to run concurrently, you want to run a program on a ton of cores on a machine, you want to go with you want to go with Go. Go is a great language for that, has remarkable performance, and does things in a really light way, way uh, in terms of being able to handle multiple cores and multiple threads. We'll talk about all those words a lot later in this course, but if you need to have run concurrent software, things that do a lot of things at the same time, a lot of helpers, a lot of workers getting up and firing at all cylinders, Go is a great language for that. Final disclaimer before we end the series of videos, this, this particular series, this will be a lot of videos in the C series, by the way, in the C module, we call it. You're not gonna learn to code C for just watching videos. You, you never learn anything by just watching TV. Uh, you have to try it yourself. You have to have an apprentice model. So we have, obviously, you've got your own C compiler. 
go play with C. As you're seeing me show code in these series of lectures, go grab up an editor and start firing it up and see if you can copy what I have. It's great. We'll have our slides available so you can cut and paste the code from our slides as well. So please do realize that you're going to learn this in homework and in projects and really not from watching lectures. You'll get a context of it, maybe understand, okay, I shouldn't do that. But in terms of really getting good at this, you need to be doing it. Um, K, K and R, this is the KNR version before, but you want the ANSI cover is a must have. Every single C programmer ever still has that version with the ANSI red logo on the front. You want to get that. There's a great Java in the nutshell book by O'Reilly. Uh, chapter two talks about how Java differs from C. Most of you are coming from 621B, so most of you have some Java experience or some C like language experience. That's a requirement for this class anyway. So take a look at that. I think you have to Google it to find where, where you can get a link to that. Um, Brian Harvey made a series of, a wonderful series of notes, uh, just a, a document, delightful, to talk about um, notes on C. So check that out, there's a link there as well. The key concept you're gonna learn here in this, in this in the language and the key concepts you're gonna learn in this series of lectures are pointers, how to work with those arrays, how to work with memory management. You probably never managed memory before explicitly. This is the first language you'll do that, that's a big idea. And there's a, from a security point of view, the key idea is everything above, everything on that list above, pointers, arrays, and memory management is unsafe. Um, you can create very unstable code. You can create code that runs a thousand times and a thousand and first time crashes. Um, and that's really hard because it's hard to debug these things that seem like they work until you ship them and all of a sudden you recompile them. They worked on your machine, but something's different, low level, and now it doesn't work again. That's that used to happen all the time. It still happens in all the C code. It doesn't happen for other languages as much. It happens in C, so you got to watch out. All right? Whew. You guys ready? Let's dig in. I'll see you at the next lecture.